talk, but it is my pleasure to introduce Barbara Friedman, who is right here, to introduce Kathy Forbes. You know, they often say that journalism is the first draft of history, and Barbara Friedman really combines both in such great ways. Over to you, Barbara. Thank you, Deb. And good evening. Thanks to everyone far and near for joining this inaugural event in our new speaker series. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kathy Roberts Ford, a distinguished alum of our doctoral program and an award-winning historian. Dr. Ford is a professor of journalism at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and co-editor with Sid Bedingfield, of Journalism and Jim Crow, White Supremacy and the Black Struggle for a New America, available in November. This eagerly awaited book is the first extended work exploring the active role white newspaper publishers and editors played in building and sustaining white supremacist political economies and social orders in the New South, as well as the resistance of the Black press. Dr. Ford is also co-editor of the Journalism and Democracy book series at UMass Press. Thank you so much, Kathy, for being at UNC tonight and for sharing your important work with us. You'll judge me based on what I have to say tonight and nothing else, which is how it should be, I think. Um, so I want to thank you all for being here today. Uh, I want to thank uh, Daniel Priest, Steph Icott, uh, Barbara Friedman, Mata B. Reddy, and uh, Valerie Booth, who uh, helped make this trip possible on the UNC side for me, for the invitation and doing all the work to make it happen. Um, and it's been a lovely visit so far. Uh, and I also want to thank my dear cousin, Mac and Jane Ford, um, for making this book from Raleigh, to listen to me carry on yet again about this book project. Um, and I, I want to thank um, everyone else for being here. We've got a lot of students, I think, joining us by Zoom. So even though you're not here in the room with us, I don't want everyone in the room to feel their presence. I think it's about 150 students. And um, I'm so grateful to you all for being here. Uh, I know this has been a really difficult time on campus, and um, I was following things from UMass Amherst, where I am, and thinking about you, you've been in my heart, and I hope you're all okay. Um, so I'm talking tonight about events that happened, and I'm going to sit here because there's not a place for me to put my, or can you not hear? We can hear. Okay. Um, I'm I'm sitting here because there's not a place for me to stand and put my uh, podium for me to put my iPad. So I'm sitting here. I hope that is fine with everyone. Um, but I'm talking tonight about events that happened in the South more than 100 years ago. But these events feel just as urgent as the events that have been unfolding around us for the past four or five years. And you're probably wondering what I mean. Maybe you're not. <laughs> but tell me if this sounds familiar to you. In Journalism and Jim Crow, my forthcoming book. My co-authors and I show how white news leaders and news media in the South joined forces with the right-wing political movement, animated by anti-democratic values of authoritarianism and white nationalism, for the financial and political interests of the elite, even if it meant spreading disinformation, whipping up racist anger and animus, suppressing the vote, attempting to steal an election through violence, and attacking democracy itself. Ring any bells? Today in this country, we have a struggle between those who believe in and wish to build a just, equitable, and inclusive multiracial democracy, and those who do not. And it is an epic struggle, and a lot is at stake. Tremendous amount is at stake. At the middle of it all is the urgent issue of history and historical knowledge. We're not used to thinking of history as an urgent matter, but we know that our country's history, how we tell it, how we remember it, how we use it to light the way forward, 
is today the object of a momentous political conflict in the United States. There's a lot of issues here at play in it. I don't want to oversimplify it, but one of the issues is how the subject of structural and systemic racism is taught in our schools. Excuse me a moment. I'm going to have to be doing some of this back and forth. Um, this campus, this school, has been through its own recent moment. It received a lot of national and international attention. Um, and in it, uh, I don't need to tell you the story <laughs> really quick, but it came from brushstrokes. <laughs> For those of you students who are joining us on Zoom who may not have followed this as closely as probably everyone in this room did, but I expect most of you know this too. Um, Walter Hassman, who is a donor, a mega donor, to this School, um, interfered in the school's attempt to hire Nicole Hannon Jones, who is a very prominent journalist with the New York Times, the originator of the 1619 Project. Um, and if you all know, the 1619 Project uh, sits at the very heart, is produced by the very center of the most culturally authoritative uh, and institution of journalism in the country, which is the New York Times. And in the King Nazi project, Nicole Hannah Jones centers the history of slavery and the Black experience in the expansive sweep of U.S. history. Well, the 1619 Project has become a lightning rod of attack from the right wing in this country. We all know this. We've seen it happening. Uh, we saw it happening in the Trump administration. We saw all types of action take place. Um, and we uh, also now know that critical race theory has come under attack. It's not a presentation in the era of Zoom unless there are technical difficulties. <laughs> to throw off the speaker. I'm going to bring myself back. Um, so I wanted to remind everyone that uh, Critical race theory has been around since the 1970s. It's a, it's a, it's a theory that originated in uh, the legal field. Uh, it's been moved into other uh, knowledge paradigms and disciplines. It's, uh, it's, it's nothing earth shattering. Uh, simply put, critical race theory uh, tells us that uh, racism has been embedded in US social systems and structures and political and legal systems and structures all along and still is, um, and that we need to be aware of that in order to root it out and correct it, and that we need correct it for this. That's it in a nutshell. Um, nothing earth shattering, like I said, it's been around since the like 70s, and in fact, historians and legal scholars and many others and many other fields have been working with these ideas for a very, very long time. But CRT has become the boogeyman of the political right in this country. If you take a look at this slide, this is simply, this is a media matters project in which they track how often uh, the term critical race theory, the actual term, has been used on Fox News from June 2020 all the way up to June 2021. Look at that. That tells, that tells a story in and of itself. It has been used uh, 1,900 times at least during that three and a half, or during the a three and a half month period from March to June of 2021, with the number of mentions doubling month by month. So part of what we want to ask ourselves is why? Why does the right we in this country wish to prevent this history, these ideas from being taught? And again, I'm going to oversimplify here. There are many reasons why the right would wish this to be so. On the one hand, they're ginning up a culture war to help fundraise for the midterms of 2022 and the presidential election of 2024. Simply that's one reason. And culture wars and identity politics are incredibly salient and uh, divisive um, political subjects. They're also shot trying to shore up a rosier popular historical narrative as the country diversifies at a rapid rate, especially among the young. So they're trying to uh, craft a history that they find more uh, salient and, and uh, not just more salient, but easier to digest 
for them and one that serves their interests. And it's also true that the young across all racial ethnic groups in the country show a, a clear interest in working toward a multiracial equitable democracy, <laughs> clear interest in projects of restorative justice. And this does not serve the interest of a certain very large now section of the political right in this country. Sorry. Thank you. I'm so sorry to ask you to change the slide for me. Oh, Lord, what have I come to? What height have I arisen to? Um, asking someone to change the slides for me. I always find that totally ridiculous in presentations, but here I am um, doing it myself. Uh, 28 states have introduced rules or legislation to prevent the teaching of critical race theory or ideas attached to it, such as ideas of systemic racism and sexism in US history and present society. That work is a significant political project at the moment. And we've just talked about what some of the reasons why that work is ongoing. So what is it in this history, in journalism and Jim Crow, white supremacy and the black struggle for a new America that I think is pretty urgent for our own moment, that I think is important for journalism students, journalism educators, journalists in the news industry, and many other people to engage and think about. So I'm going to tell you in real broad brushstrokes what the main argument of the book is. Um, and I will present to you too that this knowledge is fairly new. We're hoping to make a major thunderclap of revisionist history across multiple fields, journalism history, labor history, the history of the carceral state, history of the U.S. South, uh, and political history, as well as broadly speaking, media and communication history. So what is it that we're saying that is so novel? What we are showing and arguing is that white urban daily newspapers in the South, after Reconstruction, so after 1875, was tied to the Democratic Party which was then the party of white supremacy, built a nearly totalitarian region in this country that was anti-democratic, authoritarian, and white supremacist. Newspapers, the leaders, and the news institutions themselves played a critical role in architecting and building and then sustaining these white and social order. That is, in other words, in the South from the period of roughly 1875 to 1965, with a few very notable exceptions, the white press was participating actively in building white supremacy. We're not used to thinking of the press in 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 in, in this kind of aggregate sense, work being anti-democratic. And yet it was. <laughs> Black journalists of the era, almost every single one of them was an activist too. They saw it as it was happening, described it as it was happening, fought back against it as it was happening, and did their level best within the South and outside the, outside the South in the North, where it was much easier, it was much safer to launch a fight against what white supremacist newspapers and publishers in the South were doing and involving themselves in. They called, they, they named it, they described it, and they fought it. But they simply did not possess the institutional or the cultural power to launch as effective a fight as they needed to stop it. Um, and so this is the story that we tell in Journalism and Jim Crow. What were the interests of these white newspaper editors and publishers aligned with the Democratic Party, aligned with um, industrial interests and business interests, both outside the South and inside the South? Their own finance, their own wealth, their own affluence, their own power. They used the tools of racial terror, state sanctioned racial terror through the convict leasing system and debt peonage, which were. Uh, Exploitative labor systems that were built on uh, the exploitation 
and, uh, and brutalization of black men, women, and children. It's a very well-known history, very well-documented. Uh, and newspaper, some newspaper editors were actively protecting convict leasing and protecting those who were benefiting from the convict lease, including um, really importantly, Henry Grady at the Atlanta Constitution. They also were very interesting, interested in quashing black political power and black economic aspiration and success. And so they used the tools of racial terror in their work to get these things accomplished. Now I'm actually going to give you some examples. So, so far, it's been pretty conceptual, pretty theoretical. Oh, yeah, Kathy Ford is telling me these things happen, but okay. Let's, let me hear, let me hear this. So now I'm going to deliver some good. This is not everything that's in the book. These are just a few examples, examples for us. So, uh, Ethelbert Barksdale uh, was the editor of the Jackson Clarion in 1875. In 1875, what was happening across most of the southern states was this process called, this historical event and process called redemption. I'm gonna put that in quotation marks. Redemption was the process by which the white supremacist Democrats were trying to take rest power away from the Republican party, which was the party of Lincoln in which, which most black Southerners belonged. So by the time we get to 1875, the reconstruction in the South, which is this very brief 12 year period in our country's history, and certainly in the South, where we have this truly incredible experiment in building multiracial democracy, right? When slavery ends in 1865, you have within five years, three really important amendments added to the Constitution. The 13th Amendment abolishes slavery, except for those who are incarcerated. Really important when we want to understand how convict leasing came to be so important in the South, in the South's political economy. The 14th Amendment, which grants citizenship rights and the protection of the due process of law to all formerly enslaved persons. And then the 15th Amendment, which grants voting rights. So you have this reconstruction of the American Charter in these Reconstruction Era Amendments. This is what Eric Foner called the second founding of the country this moment in time where the Constitution itself is made to deliver on, finally, the promise of the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. Everyone should have the opportunity to pursue happiness, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those promises are being delivered on. We get 12 years of this experiment. 1877, Reconstruction comes to a crashing end. I'm not going to explain all of the, the, the gory details of how that happened. But even before Reconstruction comes to an end in 1877, the federal government removes itself from this business of trying to build this multiracial democracy in the South. Even before this, white supremacist democratic government in state after state in the South are fighting to redeem the state from Republican rule and what was often usually called Negro domination, Negro rule. This was the object. In Mississippi in 1875, Ethelbert Barksdale, who is the editor of the Jackson Clarion, still a very important newspaper in the South and was across the entire 20th century, he masterminds, along with another member of the Democratic Party, a plan called the Mississippi Plan. And this plan was uh, to Steal the election of 1876. This rut and moment total chaos in the primary running up to the election of 1876. Because guess what? At the time, Mississippi was majority black and black men could vote. And the white supremacists realized that if black men could vote and could register to vote and then actually get to the ballot box and vote, that the Republicans would maintain power in Mississippi. And they couldn't have that. They didn't want that. So Ethelbert Barksdale, the editor of the Jackson Clarion, is part of the Democratic Party's stratagem to put together white, militia, uh, white militias called the Red Shirts and rifle clubs called the White Line to spread propaganda, anti-Black propaganda through the press 
and within the newspaper, the Jackson Clarion newspaper itself, to advocate for uh, violence against anyone, uh, any black people attempting to vote, any black Republicans holding political rallies, to disrupt the bill cost, to use violence if necessary. And that's indeed what happens all over the state of Mississippi. It's an incredibly violent, incredibly deadly period for black Mississippians. It resulted in one event called the Clinton Massacre in which at least 50 uh, black Mississippians were murdered in cold blood by white posses and uh, the Red Shirts, which was a terrorist organization allied with the Democratic Party. So this is what the Jackson Clarion did, and Ethelbert Barksdale was one of the architects of this plan, which then spreads across the South to other states, including South Carolina. The Jackson Clarion offices on election day were used as a base camp for these white terrorist groups. The actual offices of the Jackson Clarion, which were right across the way from the governor's mansion in Jackson. They were used as an ammunition depot, a base camp, a command and control center for these white terrorist groups who were holding the line, they called it, and not allowing any black man anywhere near a ballot box, not only in Jackson, but all over the state of Mississippi. The governor, Republican governor, Albert Ames, as all of this was playing out in the months leading up to the election, he appealed to President Ulysses S. Grant for help, send federal troops. Things, I mean, everything's out of control in Mississippi. There is bloodshed everywhere. This is what is happening. And the Republican Party and Grant said no. And the reason why is they needed Ohio. Ohio was a, had turned against Reconstruction in the South. They needed to maintain Republican control of Ohio to maintain the presidency, to maintain the office power. And so they left Mississippi in the hands of the white supremacists. This is the political calculus that happens in the South again and again and again from 1875 up to about 1900. Then after two, but by the time we get to 1900, the South is completely in the stronghold of white supremacy. It has been redeemed. And newspaper publishers and editors play critical roles at every step of the way in many Southern states. So this is the moment I want to take a pause. Well, I'm keeping an eye on the clock. Uh, I want to take a pause, and I want to say two couple of conceptual things. Number one, during this, this history that I'm telling you, newspapers exercise what I like to call soft power. That is, newspapers told stories. And they reported the news. They were chock full of information. And there were massive commercial enterprises in the South, too. Um, and they were for profit, obviously, enterprises. And they, they told stories in their papers, uh, particularly about, in the context of the history that I'm telling you here today, they told stories about black life in the South and black Southerners. And in those stories, black Southerners were depraved, they were criminals. They were every class citizens. They didn't deserve citizenship. They couldn't be trusted with political power. They couldn't be trusted with economic power, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so the strong power of these news stories helped create a common sense in the South among white citizens, white people. It created and spread and solidified its ideology of white supremacy. That's the soft power of news products. That news can offer. They often they also spread propaganda. They also spread dis massive disinformation campaigns to serve political interests and business interests. Again, soft power, maybe soft power getting a little harder, but they also were news institutions, for-profit news institutions that had their own interests to serve, their own financial interests to serve, their own political interests to serve. And they work hand in glove with white supremacists, the Democrats, who are in public officials, and business owners, and trade associations, and press associations, and sheriff's office, and the magistrate's office, and the court to serve each other's This is how power operated. So they also, they not only use the soft power of news as a cultural product, 
state used hard institutional power to build these political economies and social orders that serve them. And they also used the very hard along the way in elections, in disrupting Black efforts uh, at self advancement through forming unions. If you look at racial massacres across the South from 1875 to 1920, there were so many. My next book is about the role of newspapers in those massacres. I don't know this for sure, but in a number, what I can say is that in a number of these massacres, several of which I'm discussing today, white newspapers played critical roles in either instigating the massacre, helping plan it and instigate it, making it happen, or in covering it up through a disinformation campaign and thus polluting not only the public sphere at that time and holding back opportunities for black advancement in the country, but also providing, putting, you know, keeping history from being fully known for a very, very long time. So on to Henry Grady over here. So the 1880s, so you, you, hear what, you hear, understand what happens in Mississippi in 1875 and the role of the, uh, the clarion there. The 1880s are this critical decade in the South uh, because this is after the federal troops have removed themselves. Reconstruction's over, right? The white Democrats have gained control in every state across the South. But how to rebuild a system of racial caste and white supremacy when the institution of child slavery is over. How to do, and when you've got the Reconstruction Era Amendment and Black Southerners are citizens, they are protected by due process of law, the Constitution says, and they have the right to vote. So how do you build this system of racial caste in the South and political economies that serve the elite, white, bankers in business and industrial class? How are you going to do it? It has to be imagined. Certain strategies have to be attempted and tried. It's a system that has to be built. Henry Grady, who was the managing editor and part owner of the Atlanta Constitution, he rose to that position in 1880. For the next decade, that critical decade of the 1880s where white supremacy came to be built, he was one of the masterminds of it. He was not the only one by far. But he was a critical architect and someone who spread a very contagious narrative about the New South. They got lots of interest in the North and got lots of traction with uh, the well-to-do affluent North with uh, industrialists. That New South ideology was pretty basic. It was, we have a New South. Um, it's time for the two sections of the country to come together. It's time for us to reconcile. Uh, the South that was before the Civil War is no more. We now have happy race relations in this country. We have we are a place of opportunity for everyone. We need to rebuild the South after the devastation of the Civil War. And to do that, we need investment from our friends in the North. We need you industrialists and you business people in the North to come South and invest in the South. We need you to build railroads. We need you to build industry. We need you to build uh, mining interests. And by the way, we have the cheapest labor imaginable. That was code language. What they had was, and everyone in that, when, when Grady was making these arguments in the newspaper, and then he made this argument in 1886 in New York City um, at Delmonico's, this you know, restaurant for the wealthy, his most famous New South speech. Every single person in that room knew what that was code for. It was code for convict leasing. Industrialists, they used some free labor, but they used tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of enslaved, uh, uh, I'm sorry, with like slavery. They were not enslaved exactly. Of black men, women, and children who had been uh, incar incarcerated, convicted of crime. Crimes, in many instances, crimes that weren't even crimes, such as bankruptcy, which means not having a job. So basically, they were uh, convicted for being Black. They were then leased out to private businesses 
such as mining interests, railroad builders, phosphate camps, turpentine camps, and plantation owners. And they were forced to work out their sentence. But in this condition, if they died, as one historian put it, one dies, go get another. They, their value was as much in as much as they could produce. What this produced in the South were sadistic boss camps uh, in inhuman and brutal conditions for everyone involved. These were, uh, it's almost unspeakable. I researched this, I write about it. It is, uh, it is, it is one of the most, this, this part of our history is so little known and because there are so many people who don't want to know it because it is so utterly disturbing. Um, so how did Henry Grady build this, this New South ideology? What was thought about it was so problematic and what was so problematic about what he did in the 1880s using the Atlanta Constitution as his tool? Well, Grady was not only, um, not only did he help increase circulation for the Atlanta Constitution and make it very powerful the most powerful newspaper in the South, but also the most powerful Southern newspaper in the country. He also became a person of such celebrity and note that his speeches and his work was published all over the country. Uh, he also was the ringleader of the Atlanta Ring, uh, or the Northern Triumvirate of three men who he helped circulate through the governorship and two U.S. Senate office, offices for the state of Georgia. All three, were owners of the convict lease. All three had a special interest in exploiting black labor and, and at least two of them became wildly, wildly wealthy. And Grady protected them every step of the way. He even protected them to such a degree that he, uh, his, his best friend, Robert Alston was killed, murdered in the state house over a convict lease, lease dispute when he exposed it uh, he was working in the state legislature. He disposed the depravity of the system. Um, we don't know exactly what happened. Many historians suspect that uh, the, these best men had something to do with the murder of uh, Brady's best friend in, 18, in 1879, the year before he rose to his position of prominence. And then he goes on for the next decade of his life. Uh, he died prematurely in 1889 in the moment, but he went on to uh, protect the convict lease and defend it at all costs in the paper and through the work that he did. He kept these leaders rotating through political office. He ran their campaign. He used his uh, newspaper to spread dis disinformation and propaganda to serve the political interests of the elite. He popularized the equal but separate ideology. Uh, that then became the, the uh, touchstone for Booker T. Washington's accommodationist politics in the South, and also became, as you all know, separate but equal, enshrined by Plessy v. Ferguson case in 1896 as the constitutional imprimatur that sanctioned Jim Crowism in the South until 1964, Civil Rights Act, and 1965, Voting Rights Act. Henry Grady was one of the great popularizers of this idea as equal but separate, which then became separate but equal. He advocated vociferously in his New South speeches and in his newspaper for the disenfranchisement of Black Southerners as the only way to guard against Negro domination. Uh, he used his newspaper as a blunt weapon against the political, economic, and social interests of Black Georgians and Southerners. We see this in his lynching coverage in which he uh, made light of lynching. He makes so-called funny, humorous uh, headlines for uh, articles about the brutal lynching of black men in the South. Uh, we see this in his lynching, his, his coverage of the convict lease. He helped build that single party, violent, kleptocratic and authoritarian democratic party framework that became known as the Solid South. Do you all remember that idea of the Solid South from your historical learning if you were, if you learned history in the United States, the Solid South? It was a kleptocracy. It was a near totalitarian state. It was a white supremacy all the way. In the very final speech of his life, he advocated against the Federal Lodge Bill. This was meant to protect black voting rights in the South. Uh, he popularized such, uh, such animus against the Federal Lodge Bill that he was one of the folks who helped uh, defeat a bill in his death when he died a month later, uh, 
his speech against the Lodge Bill was reprinted all over the country. Um, this is one of the forces that helped lead to the demise of this bill that would protect Black voting rights in Congress. Uh, and so the next year, guess what? The Mississippi Plan goes on. In 1875, there's a rebirth of the Mississippi Plan in 1890. This time, what is this? It is the disenfranchisement through constitutional amendment of all Black voters. So this is Henry Grady's legacy. What's often said about Henry Grady today is he's the builder of Atlanta, he's a great Georgian, he's a great journalist, he uh, brought baseball to Georgia, he helped, uh, he helped build a hospital in Georgia. But there's another part of the story of who Henry Grady is. And it's a significant part of the story. At during his lifetime, some of the most prominent black journalists that we learned we know about today, including T. Thomas Fortune, Ida B. Wells, W.E.B. Du Bois, they pointed a straight line to Gray. They wrote about him over and over and over again while he was doing what he was doing in the 1880s. And they pointed him out as a problem for Black Americans and Black Southerners. They pointed him out as a white supremacist. They pointed out everything he was doing about lynching and his lynching coverage and in his protection of the convict lease and in other work. They saw it. They described it. What I am saying is nothing new. But this has been a part of history that has been poorly understood and elevated by professional historians. It's public. Today, the Georgia College of Journalism and Mass Communication bears his name. Early in his adult life, Grady wrote this in an editorial in a Roman newspaper. He wrote, he addressed the editorial to his friends and brothers in the KKK. He said, the strength and power of any secret organization rests in the attribute of mystery and hidden force. Its members, he says, of this secret organization, they can be called together by a tiny signal. And when the work is done, it can melt away into shadowy nothing. That was his early message in life to the KKK, his brothers and friends. Later in his adult life, two years before his death, before uh, an, set of, an adoring crowd at the Texas State Fair, he said this, the, the supremacy of the white race of the South must be maintained forever, and the domination of the Negro race resisted at all points and at all hazards, because the white race is the superior race. This is the declaration of no new truth. It has for, abided forever in the marrow of our bones and shall run forever with the blood that feeds Anglo-Saxon. Heart. When Talon Shape, who was the black editor of a very important black newspaper in Washington, D.C., called the Washington Bee, when he learned the great died of the Texas of 1899, he wrote in his paper The Negroes of this country have no tears to shed for this dead tyrant who made a mockery of American freedom and civil liberty. In Black Reconstruction in America, published in 1935, the brilliant W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the greatest American intellectuals of any age, called Grady's New South a phantasmagoria of 5,000 lynchings, jails bursting with Black prisoners incarcerated on trivial and trumped up charges, and cats staring from every train and streetcar. He also called Grady's New South Nothing more than an armed camp for intimidating black folks. He knew of what he spoke. He was in Atlanta in 1906 when the Atlanta uh, race riot was ginned up by the white newspapers of Atlanta in a political struggle for the governorship. During that melee, um, well, maybe he wasn't there then. He was new. He was there when Sam Hose was lynched in one of the most brutal lynchings um, of the South. But uh, of any time. Um, but during the, the 1906 race riot, the dead bodies of, of Black Atlantans were laid, like they were laid next to one each other, to each other um, at the foot of the Henry Grady statue in the middle of, in the middle of Atlanta. Um, so really quickly, because I'm running out of time, um, and I think the, I'm not going to dwell on the North Carolina election of 1898 and the Wilmington massacre because I hope that everyone, all of you students who are attending, if you don't know the history of your state, 
This is a really important event in the North Carolina election of 1898. The Raleigh News and Observer with its publisher, Josephus Daniel, worked on the Democratic Party campaign to steal, to win, to win the election of 1898 of the state. What they were trying to do is wrest power away from bi, a biracial political movement called the Fusionists. So the Republican Party and the Populist Party had joined forces. So the Black Republicans joined forces with middle class and poor white North Carolinians. They said, we have shared interests here. They came together to defeat the Democrats. They held power in the North Carolina legislature. They held the governorship in North Carolina for several years. And in Wilmington, which was at the time the largest city in the state of North Carolina, Port City, was majority Black and had a thriving Black middle class. Wilmington itself had a biracial government in place, the fusionist government. The Democratic Party that year decided we are not allowing the fusionists to hold power in the state anymore. They devised the Democratic Party campaign, and Josephus Daniels of the Raleigh News and Observer was a part of it. They used violence um, and intimidation and racist propaganda in the newspapers and flat out lies about black men raping white women. We all know this uh, trope that appears again and again and again, that black men are beasts, that black men were vampires, that black men could not be trusted with political power, right? So they used this um, to drive, drive a wedge between the black Republicans and the white populace and the fusionist movement. They uh, steal the election, they stuff ballot boxes, they intimidate voters, they uh, wind up stealing the state election of 1898. But the problem they had was, it was not an election year in Wilmington. And Wilmington was the seat of, few, of this biracial political movement in North Carolina, the seat of power. So what they do is they put together a white militia and a former Confederate takes the lead and they go into Wilmington two days after the presidential election. And they commit a massacre a racial massacre in which they burned down the black press. Alexander Manley of the Daily Record had been working hard to oppose this effort. And they overthrow the duly elected government of Wilmington. It's, as far as we know, the only coup in this country's history. We've had a, a near coup, some people say, is um, unsuccessful. And this is the work, this is the role of uh, Josephus Daniel and the Raleigh News and Observer. The Raleigh News and Observer uh, acknowledged this in 2005 after there was a race riot commission report uh, put out by the legislature. Um, so let me move then to, um, to uh, talking a little bit more about what happened um, the Walter Hussman's interference in the hiring of Nicole Hand Jones here at the school. I want to place this in some historical context. And when I say I place it in historical context, it's not exact historical context. But what I, what I would say to Walter Hussman is, instead of trying to, uh, instead, of, instead of criticizing Nicole Hannah-Jones journalism, instead of taking issue with the fact that she centers, that she put forth that history that centers the Black experience in American life and slavery, and tells the American story with that as the center. Instead of attacking her credentials, instead of really hating the fact that she supports reparations, instead of doing all that, why don't you take a very close look at the history in your own state and the history of two of the newspapers you now own. This is the family did not own them, own them at the time. But why don't you take a, a look at the history in your own state and the history of the newspapers that are now the Arkansas Democrat and Gazette. Why don't you take a look a look at what they did in 1919 in Arkansas when they were two separate newspapers, the Arkansas Gazette and Democrat. Um, I am going to wrap up really quickly here. But just, here's what they did. In Elaine, Arkansas in 1919, you have a group of black tenant farmers and sharecroppers who decide they thought they were, they're caught up in the debt peonage system being exploited by plantation owners. And it's a super lucrative cotton crop that year. And they decide we want our fair share, we're gonna organize. So they organize a union, they hire a white lawyer to press claims against the white plantation owners. White plantation owners get wind of this and they instigate a series of events 
that turns out in, into the largest racial massacre in this country's history post Civil War, with anywhere from black men, women, and children killed and burned out of their homes at the number of like in the low 100s, all the way up to 800. We don't know. We do not know the number because this history has been so successfully washed and evidence um, done away with. Reporters from the Arkansas Gazette and Arkansas Democrat were there every step of the way reporting on what happened as it happened. And the story begins to change. Something that they, they first start reporting in, in good faith and very quickly they begin reporting out a concocted story put together by this group of the Committee of Seven appointed by Governor Brock um, in which they falsify the record. Well, here's what happened. Governor Brock invites 550 federal troops, war harvest during World War I to Elaine. There's 1,000 white uh, posse men from three different surrounding areas of Elaine, which is in the Arkansas Delta, from Tennessee, Arkansas, and Mississippi. You've got 1,500 well-armed white men coming in, and they are being told incorrectly that the Negro community of Elaine had planned an insurrection in which they were planning to kill 21 of the most prominent white landowners and take over their land. What happens is a full-on massacre. It takes place over several days where you have the black population of Elaine, men, women, and children, hiding in swamp and cane breaks. You have people hanging, black people in Arkansas hanging from bridges. You have people killed. You have, uh, you then have thousands uh, brought, you know, in, in uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Anyway, they were arrested, they were interrogated. Uh, 12 men were tortured into confessing that they were part of this insurrection. They were sentenced to death. Guess who comes to save the day? The spiritual godmother of Nicole Hannah Jones, a woman by the name of Ida B. Wells, one of the bravest and most fearless journalists of any generation. At this point, Ida B. Wells is 57 years old. She is the leading anti lynching activist in this country. She is a suffragist. She's devoted her entire, almost her entire adult life to documenting and pushing back against lynching and trying to get the scourge of this practice and convict leasing out of the South. She goes down for the first, her first time returning to the South. She had to leave in 1892 when a mob in Memphis burned her press and runs her out of the South when she reports the truth of lynching, what happened to her friends. That they were lynched not because they assaulted a white woman. They were lynched because they were running a very successful grocery store that cut into the profits of white grocery store owners in the black community. She comes down undercover along with Walter White, who is, uh, was a biracial activist and journalist who worked in the NAACP. They both come down, investigate, and report out the truth. He publishes a, a report. I'm sorry, I think I, here's Ivy Wells, there's Walter White. For the Elaine 12, if we can. She publishes the Arkansas race riot. She sets the record absolutely straight. She goes on to raise money along with the NAACP to defend these men. Their case goes all the way to the US Supreme Court. They uh, eventually get their freedom. And yet, the Elaine massacre, until very recently, is still almost unknown in Arkansas and Southern Tennessee. So this is the history that I want Walter Hessman to talk about. The newspapers he owns today were major players in this event. And disinformation is spread all the way to the New York Times and it spread to newspaper front pages all over the country. Uh, this the story of Negro insurrection is the story that was told. The descendants of Elaine today are asking for reparations. They're asking for restorative justice. I think they have claim, I think they have very valid claim to the municipality of Elaine, to the county government of Phillips County, to the state government of Arkansas, and to media institutions that played a role in these events. I think they have a very just claim. So 
So my talk has part of its title, why does, should journalism education care about these things? Why should the journalism industry care about this history? We need diverse voices and diverse leadership in journalism higher education and in newsrooms. We need diverse perspectives. We need uh, a diverse array of issues and representations uh, covered. We need people who understand how to place singular incidents in historical perspectives, but also in perspective of uh, systems like contemporary political, economic, and social systems and structures and to make sense of them. We need many voices doing this work. We need many hands doing this work. I think we need to have a revolution of journalism standards. In this country, I think we need a key conversation. Are we really going to hang our hat on impartiality and neutrality? Is that really what we want? <clears throat> or do we want a journalism that is attached to reality, that is attached to <laughs> that is attached to expertise, that is committed to values of serving the public good, serving democracy, and building a just, inclusive, multiracial democracy. What would those values look like? What would those words be? Would they be impartial? Would it be neutral? I don't know. But I think that's a conversation we should have. And when we come up with that, I don't know, know that we need to etch them in stone either. I think they will be a living document, as all of these, all of these statements of what journalism is and should be, must live and change with the times, just as our constitution has, just as do we all. I wanna thank you all for coming in. Those of you on, uh, on Zoom students, thank you for being here.